Okay, so I do have a PDF you can download here of the slides minus the videos if you would like to go and follow along or have notes and links for later. So this is just something you can get. I'll give you about 15 seconds, uh, you know, and then we'll go ahead and just start on with the slides. Uh, but yeah, thank you everybody for coming to Tactics of the Trash Panda, uh, the real TTP acronym, the only TTP acronym. All other acronyms are garbage compared to this one. Uh, I still see phones out, so I'm going to wait a little bit. Cool. Let's get started. So uh, just a quick who am I? I am an InfoSec doer. I'm a senior consultant at Dark Wolf Solutions. I'm a 3D printer enthusiast. I've been hacking and doing crazy things, uh, but getting paid for it for the past six years. Uh, I've been trained in multiple disciplines, such as NetPen, AppSex, physical uh, vulnerability research. I'm a proud member of DC Throne 6, occasionally dropped by AHA and SecKC. I do have a disclaimer here, so the following presentation will deal with security and adjacent topics. Consequentially, some of the content may be of adult nature. This content is handled in a professional manner by me, and I hope you can handle it with respect as an audience. So if you do have any, any qualms against this, uh, please feel free to leave the room now. If not, you know, whatever. Uh, additionally, content is provided for educational use only. I take no responsibility for any actions taken by the audience as a result of this. Let's behave ourselves and have a little fun. So let's talk about like modern physical entry and red teaming. Uh, you have this problem of mo tradecraft mo problems. As you get into specialized tooling markets, you start having the need to fill those markets and needing to improve on that. And that either costs money or development or reduces the ambiguity you can use on site with certain pretexts. These tools become less of uh, tools you can mend to your pretext and more just red team tools, right? Some other problems is your geographic location where you're performing these tests may restrict you from utilizing certain tools. We know Canada has some stuff going on proposed for a bunch of SDR stuff. Lockpicks are illegal in certain countries and uh, per state there are different lockpicking laws. I'm not an expert on the lockpicking laws. You can talk to the people at the lockpicking village for that. But let's get down to some proposed solutions. Uh, you have Batman over here, which looks weird in some movies. He has like money or something and he just breaks into places that he could just buy easily, right? Um, but on the other hand, you have a raccoon. They look awesome, they eat trash, and they break into anywhere without spending a dime. So how do we mimic this behavior? How do we become more resourceful? Today I'm going to be telling you about how to do this, and I'm going to be walking through how to present yourself and advice for packing, my own kit, commercial tradecraft and tooling primer, uh, attempting to replicate these with our own variants, and some video demos, and then I can show you how to practice on your own in a kind of legal way. So just a quick thing about physical evaluations. They're a great way to show the internal network isn't too hard to reach. There's a lot of prep work before even scoping the place out in person, and all your legality and paperwork is a pain. Normally you go to a consultancy that has this figured out if you're trying to get into the field and do this testing instead of going freelance. Um, and you can't always use repeat pretext for scenarios. There's always something unique about a test. Um, so preparation mainly entails lots of preparation, uh, of objectives, your connections, your out of office, your trash schedules, your tech stacks, your fire code, your disability measures applied to the building and whatnot, uh, your surveillance schedules, your antics behavior, contingency planning, um, having good luck, and a lot of reading. So some of this reading might be your normal fire code. So NFP 80 is like an RFC but for doors and buildings kind of. Um, there's also the ADA compliance standards, and these are for, uh, in the US, they're kind of like RFCs, but for doors and buildings. And a lot of modern tooling that is considered red team tooling is based on the foundations of these documents. Um, so let's talk about getting into pretext packing. An improv class goes a long way before you go out and register for some advanced red team training or something like that. You might just try your local theater and just get the basics down in one discipline first. Um, I have used multiple pretexts. Some of the more common ones are here. These are by no means comprehensive. I've used the authoritative pretext of, oh, I work for a help desk, or I'm an IT person, or I'm some C-level that hates people. I don't know. Um, or you can have mutual bonding, lighting somebody's cigarette. You can hold the door open or be courteous and kind, right? Or you can be a meek inquisitor. If you're trying to gain information, you can go around and ask and say, oh, I'm new here and whatnot, and weave your shenanigans through that way. Uh, but play to your strengths, right? These pretexts, it's never, oh, I was born this way, so I, I have infinite pretexts or something like this. Um, it's always whatever you find is good about yourself, and you can strengthen that and use that to your advantage in pretext. Uh, game is game. If you get into the building, like that's it, right? Like, cool. So a little more about packing. Um, 
prepare for multiple pretexts to be used. Don't just have like one outfit, right? Um, have the ability to maybe even swap on site once you're outside of the hotel room and on the client site, being able to change. Um, there's lots of treasure troves of information online from employees and um, charity events and whatnot that you can scrape that information from. Uh, don't impersonate in ways that will make you catch a case. Please do be legal with this. Um, talk to your lawyers if you have questions on this. I'm not a lawyer. Have clothing for your archetypes and covers, right? If you have, say, a construction worker vest, don't bring that shit in clean. You're going to walk into a place with a, a nice shiny hard hat and a clean construction worker vest and, oh, wow, yeah, I've been here for three years working, or hard day's work, and no, get out of here. Like, um, how I phrase these types of pretexts and planning, I do say an improv class goes a long way, but there's kind of a framework I have where I use props to perform my skit with punchlines as the anchors. So for instance, you can have a clipboard with, with an RFID reader inside, and you can have a coffee and a handkerchief, and these can be your props, right? And you can say, oh, I want to get a clone of somebody's badge, so I have to get really close to them, right? And let's say some scenario plays out where you're outside the building and, oh gosh, hey, could you hold this for me really quick? I, I got this coffee all over my shoes, I spilled it all, I'm just cleaning up. Here, hold this clipboard with the RFID reader next to your chest, right? Um, things of that nature and always, you know, work with the flexibilities you have. Normally, you don't have to worry about your hotel rooms being searched, but um, obviously with some recent uh, happenings at resorts in the area, that might be, uh, I need to update that slide. Uh, <laughs> Talking about practicality packing, uh, bring just enough tooling so different goals will have different loadouts. You want to have raw material for lots of use cases and maximum flexibility, such as wires, strings, and pins. You want to plan for failure, so if you're caught with a certain tool out, how do you talk yourself out of that situation, right? We don't want to have to just pull out our letter of authorization immediately and that's it. That's the test, right? We want to kind of try to fall gracefully as we do this. Um, Practice quick deployment. So as you work with your tools and specialized equipment, you want to practice pulling that out, putting it away very quickly so you can increase your speed run strat for this, to say. And then also check what's legal and allowed on your person in case of X event. For instance, in the state of Kansas, you may require, be required to give fingerprints if a cop catches you and you have pics on your person and you're doing some type of burglar activities, right? So here's my kit and the approximate usage for it. So you can see here there are a lot of familiar tools, and I'll start moving over here. Um, my most used one by far has to be these plastic shims and this like local supermarket market shopper's card. Um, but I have gear ties, flashlights, some bump keys, a little lever, like a wedge thing, um, some shims for loiting, our, our punch bar, our um, traveler hook, some bobby pins, my under the door tool, and we'll get to the mods and, and some of those here in a second, and extra Kevlar rope, and yeah, just all the goodies there that aren't electronic. And here's some other stuff. So there's my modded under the door tool based on Debian Alums and not so civil engineers modifications that they committed to their under the door tools using Kevlar rope. There's also the Humble Firefighters Mini J tool, which is great. I think it's an awesome replacement for a double door tool uh, that you can find online. And this is just made out of some cheap titanium rods you can get off of Amazon. So what I don't show here is, of course, all the cables for the gadgets and gizmos, but uh, here's all your electronic stuff. Um, I've lost numerous Leatherman multi-tools just because I forgot them in my carry-on and TSA had to confiscate them. RIP, right? Uh, but yeah, for the rest of this talk, we'll cover the physical entry, implants and devices, and what your wireless evaluations. So talking about your under-the-door tool options, uh, Not-So-Civil Engineer has amazing guides, uh, comprehensive guides on your under-the-door tool modifications you can make for different out, uh, outlooks and different scenarios. So you have your standard under-the-door tool from uh, Sparrows and other vendors will do this. You can buy that for about $40, and that's quarter-inch to three-eighths-inch uh, high-carbon steel, and it's foldable. It lasts pretty long, uh, as long as you take care of it. If you're in a pinch, you can buy zinc rods from Menards, and these rods do not retain the shape well, so prepare to use these for like maybe one or two uses and then throw them out. Uh, other metals, try it and share. Uh, titanium could be a proposed solution, but it's really expensive uh, in that size, so I wouldn't recommend it as a budget option. So getting into your budget and low profile options, you do have some not so civil engineer recommendations of the copper tubing at quarter inch with framing wire. And you can make three of these for about $30 in my local market in the Midwest. Um, these you cannot easily substitute Kevlar cord for as you could the normal under the door tool. And we'll see you out here in a second. Um, your takedown under the door tools, which is the ones that bolt together, they add a little bit more thickness to it and they can be harder to fit under certain scenarios. So I don't really go with that. You can compensate by carrying an air wedge with you and rely on that more, but it's not an option I really use in the field. So uh, looking at the, the mods, here's a close up. So I've, I've dug this groove. 
similar to what's recommended off YouTube, right, uh, with a Dremel, and I just put my Kevlar cord here, and I'm able to use this on crash bars and whatnot, because this hooks into the door, and I'm able to use the cord to push that uh, for the crash bars. Um, and actuate that, right? And I have some uh, tape up here so that it, it's increased friction. Now, this is the one you can't substitute Kevlar cord for. So the reason you can't do this is because this is dog catcher design. And this is meant to be for doors with little levers. So you can slide this under the door, and this is where the door is sitting, and you can actuate the handle by grabbing it, kind of like uh, animal control does for dogs, right? And you just pull this little cable right here. And Kevlar doesn't really work for that. Uh, Talking about shims, uh, so some people buy the Super Micro shims from Red Team Tools and other vendors. These are kind of expensive, but you can buy them in bulk. They're just called Mylar stencil sheets, and we'll get to the measurements that I recommend here in a second. But yeah, the bulk is a uh, much better value, and you can cut them however you want. You get much longer material, so you can be more flexible with it. Um, Dylan's card or supermarket card, this one just happens to be a good combination of thinness and rigidity. And it's free, it saves you money in the long term, and like, what accusations are going to follow you if you get found with a Dylan's card, right? Like, oh, I want to save money on gas. Oh, oh no, like, kill me, right? Um, you can use laminated paper. Uh, I've had buddies who have used this, but it does take work, and this probably means that you've lost your other tooling and you're really been a pinch. So, yeah, uh, just explore your options there. So for shims, I recommend 14 to 16 mil thickness for the best results. Your 10 mil thickness is tolerable, uh, but cutting these, you're going to have different notches for different types of locks. Should you ever run into, say, this lock, you're going to cut a notch like this and be able to close the door on it so that you push on one of these arms, and then you'll be able to actuate it open as you're closing that door back, um, assuming you've got the other locks handled on the door. This is the normal hook that you do for your normal bezel out uh, style doors, uh, so you can load those latches properly and you can just open that door like it's nothing. I did run into a couple scenarios where doors had improper latch mechanisms and deadlock mechanisms that uh, they just added one of these after we exploited it. And I was like, wow, does that help? Because I was actually curious. I, you know, I wasn't being sarcastic at the time. It does not help. <laughs> All you have to do is just have a long piece of material that will go through the top or the bottom of this, and you can just fold that up and put it in your wallet. So that's, hence, buy the Mylar stencil sheets so you can fold those up and deploy these long mechanisms out. Oop. Got a little video demo for loiting here. And this is all it is. Um, you know, loading has been talked about heavily on the internet. Internet. I'm not going to reiterate it to you, but this is basically the gist of it. That deadlock plunger isn't properly actuated, so we're able to just push that in and open the door. No problem. So talking about strings and cordage, we noticed in the under the door tools, I had some steel examples and Kevlar examples. Uh, the steel cable is coated and shielded. You have to inspect this prior to every use, otherwise you will really mess up your client's doors. And that's not a very good look when they're paying you to do this work. Um, we want to be respectful with our entry. Your rigidity increases the space taken by storing it and folding it up, so it's, it's harder to pack at times. And it's difficult to cut without your beefier tools, depending on the cable thickness you get. Your Kevlar rope is great. It's more forgiving and it's easier to cut. The only problem is not like nylon rope with uh, burning it. To seal the end off, you have to use some type of resin or epoxy so it doesn't fray on you. Uh, but this is great. You can get 1.1 diameter uh, thickness and it holds about 200 pounds of force on that rope. So very tough stuff. Seamstress tape has been used before on the internet a lot. Uh, you can use this as an under the door tool, but it goes over the door technically and it actuates the lever from the top side. And you just slip that around. Same with 35 millimeter film rolls that we've seen before on the internet. And that stuff I didn't demo because it's been done so many times. It's not like an original idea. I mean, none of this really is original ideas. All right. Uh, I recommend gear ties as well. A buddy of mine recommended gear ties to hold your gear and fold your under the door tools and hold things together, and they're amazing. And I have about like two on me almost all the time. So, talking about wire, I bring electrical wire, Dupont connectors, uh, just for some programming over serial for certain devices and implants, and then I have alligator crimps just in case you do need it to tap into things. Uh, physical tooling, I have two millimeter thick wire, uh, pliable and capable of holding its own weight. So you can get this from barbed wire or real estate signs, estate sale signs, and fencing wire. This won't harden very well. So if you want to use this for more rigid purposes, it's not going to go well. Talking about picks, so your lock picks are not always accessible in lock pick form, right? They come in many shapes and sizes, and you want spring steel and high quality ones normally. 
but we don't have that blessing here in this scenario. We are a raccoon. So we are using bobby pins and windshield wipers, which has been done all over the internet online. So here's how I do it with bobby pins. So you get your normal bobby pins. You cut the ends off, right, the little bulbs. I recommend filing down the edges because you will cut yourself otherwise. I've done it multiple times. And then you can use it as a lock pick, right? Um, otherwise, if you're going to go to O'Reilly's after a rainy day, you can pick up all of these beautiful uh, windshield wiper internals and turn these into your lock picks. And all you have to do with these, these are steel or some type of steel metal. Um, so you can just heat these, bend them, quench them in water, or use motor oil, and they should be good to go. And that's a tension wrench. And this one I just filed with a Dremel. As you can see, it's very crude, but they work, right? You can use bra wire as well. This stuff's pretty good. Um, if this is something that you can carry on your person or works with your pretext, that's awesome. Use it. It's good stuff. Just make sure to cut the ends off and pr pry all the weird silicone stuff rubbings from it. Um, talking about keys. So a one-time investment in known keys or cabinet keys, you can be the key duplicator for your entire community. You can buy one of these key duplicating machines, buy one of those rings off of eBay that's you know, $70 and just start printing out keys that are the same as these. These are very easy to pick up and, and use. You, know, you can learn it in about five minutes, right? Um, and Keychain of Doom, the Oak City Locksport, uh, they have their, their pre-made keys that you can find online, right? So uh, here's an example, CH75-1s. And then bump keys. Bump keys are, this is a known thing, uh, are used to have bump attacks on locks and be able to break easy locks open, right? Uh, just by actuating as many pins as we can at the same time and trying to get that. These bump keys normally are paired with these goat banding kits for faster reverberations towards the back. Um, and yeah, these are very cheap and they're used for goat banding and you can use them for these bump keys. It's amazing. So here's an example of that. And we'll get to kind of the science of of the bump hammers here in a sec. So as you can see here, here's the normal key. Nobody steal that bidding, that's my house key. Um, <laughs> and then we have our bump key with our heavily used goat banding kit. And by heavily used, I mean on the bump key, not goats. I'm not going to reuse it that way. That's not sanitary. <laughs> so as you can see here, we're just fitting it. Inspecting it before use because these can break very easily. And we're just going to take a solid hammer object or something and just bump the back of it while we're, we're holding slight tension on that in the direction the key is supposed to go. So as you can see, it's not open there. We we'll use a screwdriver. I'm just going to tap it a few times. And it opens. And there you, it turns, right? Oh, bump key, crazy stuff, right? It's not, not too crazy, right? Oh. Slideshow, come back. Um, alternatively, there's an energy transfer that you can mess with. If you have materials that are stiffer, they will make more sound on the bump hammer as opposed to materials that are more gelatinous. Um, so as you can see here, I have an ASA printed phallic device, and this is something that you can use to bump the, the key uh, very easily and even faster than the screwdriver, really. Um, it was like midnight when I printed this and I was hot off the press and I was like, I hope this works, just go, come on. And yeah, it just opens right up. Um, so that's one example. If you go on the other end of the spectrum with something more gelatinous, more like a silicone, um, what you'll get is you'll get worse energy transfer, so less reliability, but you'll get a, a uh, much more stealthy approach that won't make as much noise. Uh, for size recommendations, if you're going the silicone route, I do recommend about six to seven inches. Uh, you know, I, that was a nine one, that was way too much. It's unreliable. Uh, but yeah, like the sweet spot about six, six to eight, you yeah, know, something like that. So. Now, the question is like, why would you do this? Like, what, what's, what's the point of this besides it's funny, right? Like, it is funny. Um, having a flamboyant uh, device when you're doing these types of things can create a guise. Normally, when you're talking to guards or looking at how they're trained, they're trained to solve escalations in terms of encounters. But they're not trained to, you know, come around a building and they see a person knocking on the door. Um, normally, if you turn around with a bump hammer that looks like this, uh, you know, you might eat lead because this is very threatening in the middle of the night. And oh, that's a bump hammer. There's no way you're going to talk yourself out of that. Uh, but if you're coming around and you know you're 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 bumping a door open, security guard guard shines a light on you, and you're like, oh, oh I'm sorry, oh, my boyfriend and I have seven years. He works here, and we broke up, and I'm just going through it. 
they're not going to know how to respond sometimes. It's, it's something that allows you, you're already caught, you're already to the point of almost failing. You can gracefully fall and have a non-zero percent chance of getting away with it. In the story, this scenario is based off of the guard simply walked away and just left. They didn't report any of this, they didn't call extra authorities, none of that. They just, they just left. That, that's just how it went down. Um, because some people aren't trained to handle that. So, again, um, people have used vibrators and pumpkin carvers for lock picking guns. I think this is like too much of a power requirement and it's too noisy, right? For the meme, it's cool, right? But uh, usefulness is it, not as useful, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, the more flamboyant, the better. So let's talk about keys and replication of keys. Uh, this slide I actually made the day the replicant was dropped on Covert Insurance website. And uh, what had happened was they were like, oh, $90 for this kit. And we look at what the kit is and cool, it's all put together and whatnot. I can order it very quickly, but 20 ounces of molding clay, all this metal ingots, okay, a, a crack spoon, um, and then some other stuff, right? However, this wonderful individual on the internet made a 3D printed model of a similar device. So all you have to do is have a buddy with a printer or print something on your, so, your own and use this device and you're able to replicate keys. And let, let's look into uh, the process of getting that. I recommend Sculpey 3 polymer clay. Other Sculpeys have kind of been an issue, but essentially you just want to pack this um, with the clay and make sure it's rolled flat, right? And then what you want to do is you want to put some type of baking powder on this, some type of thing to release that. Uh, releasing agent is what it's called. Some people use like uh, baby powder, I use baking powder is what I had on hand. And then you put your key, let's say you obtain the key and you need to mold it now. So okay, well I got the key, give me about like 10 seconds. Okay, put it in, take it out, and you carve this little, this little hole so air can escape when you're casting this key. And then once you've done that, the process looks kind of like this. A blank YouTube video. Um, I see people doing this all the time. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like a common thing. Uh, so yeah, they're big into security. Everybody's big into security. But yeah, as you can see here, I'm using very primitive tools, just a small Bic lighter from a gas station, a spoon, and then I've got the, uh, this was actually not Woods Metal, it was Cero Safe, which is uh, slightly different, but still primarily, or like a third lead. So be careful with these. You should use gloves and like properly ventilate and all that, I say, as my hands are bare in this. Uh, but as you can see there, we have the cast, and the cast is held together by none other than a gear tie, yeah. And we get this melted, and once it's mostly in liquid form, we just go ahead and pour that, and it fills the cast. And actually this take of the video, I actually messed it up, so it didn't go in very much, and, and it broke. But after numerous tries, after numerous tries, um, we got it. So I essentially went from zero to key casting in less than an hour plus like a three minute video that I watched. Uh, it was not very difficult to pick up. Like practice makes decent on this, right? So as you can see here, we've got the quote unquote finished key replica and then we've got the normal key. And there's some defects with the key replica as you can see here, but with wiggling it, I was able to overcome this so it wasn't too bad. Uh, mostly functional, right? Like if I put it in, it doesn't turn immediately, but I just rock it back to fill up for that gap. And then should open right up. And there you have your key, right? These keys are really very delicate. Remember, this is about 33% uh, lead. So let's talk about crash bar hooks. Uh, the Sparrows one is bulky, and rubber has to be trimmed on it. Um, you can make your own, and I recommend using titanium bars or steel bars. Uh, you can get these online. Realtor signs have wireframe that can be used, but they can't be hardened very well, so try to avoid this unless it's your last ditch effort, and you can try to double up on the real estate sign and make kind of two wires going along, but it doesn't really work too well. Here's a hanger that I had in my room, and it was all metal, thankfully, so we lucked out on that speed run tech, and that's the first two steps. I reinforced it with some Kevlar cord and the rest of the hanger and then some gaffer tape, and this supports about five pounds of force on that uh, hook point, whereas the Sparrows one is about 20 before it starts really bending. So it's give and take, right? Looking at this double door J tool, the humble, humble firefighter has the instructions on how to make these properly. Uh, but as you can see here, here are the specifications. Uh, this would go in terms of your doors. It would go kind of through here and actuate the door from the, the uh, outside, right? 
I think three millimeter titanium is great. Shout out Rob Moore for that. He recommended titanium over steel. Um, if you heat this, you want to heat it red, you want to bend it, and then you want to air cool it and, or sand quench it and not do the whole uh, water quenching, oil quenching. With steel, you want to do the quenching in water or use motor oil. Um, with titanium, there is a spring back effect. So when you bend it, it's going to spring back normally. So if you're going for a 90 degree angle, you want to go a little bit more uh, in terms of the bend, right? And you'll see the manufacturing here in a second. And I think audio hopefully has passed through. I don't know where I'm hearing the audio from, but I can just hear it faintly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but as you can see here, this is the titanium uh, three millimeter bars. And we just heat these up. I am not wearing gloves or ventilation equipment or shoes, proper <laughs> shoes. Don't replicate this. Uh, this is, yeah. So you heat it red, you bend it. And once it's bent, you, you kind of let it sit there or you do your sand quenching, right? Don't use wet sand. Um, and the sand quench technique, that was actually, um, I found that on a, a fishing forum where people were talking about uh, titanium wire and whatnot. So let's talk about forensics tools, finding your keypad touches. Uh, you can have dust reacting to ultraviolet light. And this is suspicious procuring and traveling with. It's kind of like, how do you, how do you sell this off, if TSA is going to look at you weird, how do you get it past them? And it doesn't even get you high, like you paid $13 and like that's the only use it has is finding fingerprints. Uh, versus sucrose based powder, which honey dust, the pleasure driven retailers have this all the time, uh, it sticks to oils very easily. It's available at your pleasure driven retailers and it's cornstarch, baking powder, or powdered sugar types of alternatives. The thing is honey dust has such a small granule size, it's amazing for fingerprints. I have tried baking powder in the past, I had tried powdered sugar in the past. Nothing comes close to honey dust and, and its ability to just uh, stick to anything because it's so small uh, in terms of that particle size. And you can see here, there are a couple techniques that uh, we have, but uh, clean-ish keypad, and we can see there are like no super visible fingerprints, whatnot. And I'm going to go ahead and, and just use it like a normal person would, right? I'm a, oh, I'm an authorized personnel typing in the code I know. Oh gosh. And as you can see there, there's already residual ridges um, from your fingers. And you can see that in the glimpse where that, eye, where that light reflects. And if we want to abuse that, we can just throw this powder at it, this honey dust powder with the feather applicator that comes with the device. <laughs> and it stands out like crazy good, right? Like, you can see that a lot better. And you want to wipe the surface a little bit. You don't want to be too um, tough on it, right? Because you'll lose the fingerprints eventually. Uh, but with the feather duster, it's amazing. I've actually flown with a jar of this honey dust and that feather applicator in my carry-on to numerous states and have gotten no looks from TSA. I try to make eye contact. Anytime they're inspecting my bag, I will bait them and I will look at them. They're cowards. They don't look at me. I'll carry two of those, those bump hammers in my bag and the powder. They do not turn. There was one guy who was a TSA agent who just looked around frantically. And I was like, no, I'm right here. You know where I am. Look at me. Look at me. Um, here's a technique using a highlighter, a yellow highlighter, um, and a uh, ultraviolet light, or a black light. And as you can see here, I'm just drawing little X's on it, little formation shapes. Um, these are supposed to be interrupted by the fingerprints whenever people touch them. So this is kind of pre-rigging. Whereas the honey dust is investigating who touched what buttons on there. This is saying, oh, my target's going to come through this door and touch these buttons. Let me go ahead and prime this for use, right? So we've made the X's. And as you can see here, we've got the X's and they stand out pretty well. And we're going to go ahead and you know, be our target and we, we type these things in. And you can see the ridges just interrupt the portions of the X's. Um, I have been told uh, by coworkers that to use a uh, non-smudge or don't go for the non-smudge highlighters that are yellow. I tried other colors, but yellow highlighter is just the best. The others just don't work as well. I'm talking about door alarm bypasses. So K and J magnetics, shout out them. They're cool. They have strong magnets. Your neodymium magnets. The reason these, this is important is because when you're trying to get magnets through crevices and through small areas, you want the neodymium ones because they are stronger. Uh, there are normal magnetic paper sheets you can use, but they were just never strong enough uh, to actuate what I needed them to in this device. Um, you can also use the polarity detecting papers if you can't get one of these dipole magnet detectors. Um, 
around that area. So this is this is a lab environment, obviously. So it's like best case scenario, kind of proof of concepty. As you can see, this is a huge magnet. So the process is essentially slip magnet between other magnets. That's it. And then once you've done that, uh, you can't really hear the alarm go off because of the sound set up here, but um, it doesn't go off and it's, it's silent. And, oh, cool, you've, you can do whatever you want now. Go pen test all the things, right? And that's one technique you can do. So talking about HID, so this is a subject I'm not as strong as, uh, but there are a lot of cool devices on the market nowadays. Uh, but starting out, I like to use the Arduino uh, shields that came, there's the low frequency and the high frequency ones you can buy. And there's a lot of cool GitHub projects that do like MyFair 1K classic uh, cracks and whatnot. You can uh, brute force those keys or you know do a dictionary attack against known keys. And this is a heavily talked about thing. There's the Chameleon Pro, which is cool, Flipper Zeros, and some other devices coming out. Um, Great Scott has an awesome video on trying to extend the RFID range. Um, for some of these readers and going over the math and all the cool electrical engineering stuff I'm too dumb to understand. And basically just takes these eBay ones and is able to extend that range a little more by adding some capacitors here, um, changing the circuit, right? Um, if you do buy these large coils that are meant for longer range reading, you do have to have pre-made keys normally for them. Um, as you can see, that's like a low frequency one, but you would have to set it up properly so it negotiates with the car, uh, the uh, handshake. So talking about disguises, uh, Goodwill is drip. Goodwill is awesome. Uh, not as a company, but like what you can buy there. Some swag can be ordered, so your Walmart vest, you might see these go on sale on eBay before Black Friday. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, what I use recently is a uh, zinc printer. It's a type of paper where you'll see people have this Polaroid type set up. It's a small battery power device that fits in your hand, and you're able to use these pre-formatted sheets of paper to print pictures. And so here's the printer. And I say, oh, okay, you know, like, let me open like Snapchat editor or something and make my fake uh, little, little picture. And this is the one I made for another presentation at a community college. And as you can see here, this just prints out in a matter of minutes. And you can just put it on any card. Now, upon really close inspection, you can notice, oh, it's not the exact same size as the card, but you can fill it in by printing a blank sheet of paper and filling it in, et cetera, changing things. If you do have these disguises where you have lanyard and whatnot, and your pretext says, oh, I've been here a while, then run those into the ground. Don't make them look new, right? You don't want to look like you just got back from the Kinko's, right? Uh, so yeah, wear them down. Sharpie's good as well. Talking about implants, your USB HID implants, uh, rubber duckies are cool, but like, have you ever felt bad for leaving one at a, a site, like a $50 dongle or $75 dongle? You're gonna lose that because your PowerShell payload had to run? Really? These are $1. Uh, if all you need is HID emulation, uh, then you can just run these and then leave them. Oh, okay, cool, I don't care I left that at our customer site. They can burn that, they can do whatever they want. It was only a dollar. There is previous research on the Weed Suite and the Weed Elite Suite. Uh, I suggest you go check that out. But if you will use a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero W, you can have the Pwn Pi Aloha kit, which uh, in, back in the day used to be a really cool kit that had like air gap bypasses and all this HID mass storage emulation. It could do a whole bunch of cool stuff. Um, when you do that wiring, I wire it up so that these uh, four connectors are all on the same USB port, and it's actually at a right angle. Some people buy the adapter, so it's your Pi and then the weird USB port, and it's a really long thing. But for a certain use case, I bent it 90 degrees and needed it so I could go up to a help desk, talk to the help desk person. They're using an all-in-one. I'm talking to them. Their all-in-one is right here. I plug it in, and it fits nicely because of that 90 degree angle. Um, and then I leave and I get my shell, et cetera. You can also use Logitech dongles. These are about $7 each and if you set these up you can use a github project to uh, go ahead and just set up communications for keystroke injection for these HID implants. Talking about your network monitoring network taps, uh, Raspberry Pi's got expensive, right? Uh, so using passive monitoring, I like the Orange Pi series as long as they support RMBN so you're not downloading some weird image off of github. Um, you want to spoof Mac usually as printers or, or uh, yeah, Mac devices or VoIPs. Uh, those are great devices to spoof. Now, do be warned, if you run into network access controls, et cetera, or you, you have some type of authentication, you might have to change this. It's not context aware, right? But you can add buttons as well. So for GPIO pins, you can add buttons to say, okay, start monitoring, start capturing packets. Okay, now exfil out. Okay, now do this. Uh, so they're great little platforms, and they're half the price of Raspberry Pis most of the time. And you know, you have some like, here's some just lazy exfil methods, right? You can DNS tunnel, you can use like ngrok, Cloudflare, whatever to prove the point, right? Um, you can purchase your LTE hats to do out of band stuff, whatever. 
Your powerless taps are error prone, so if you do a passive tap, right, that is going to drop a lot of packets, and it's also going to downgrade the connection to 100 base TX based on how it works. Don't ask me how it works. It's just I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't do that stuff. Um, but no idea if you'll fry something, if you get like an Ethernet port or PoE, et cetera. Um, I've done it with PoE, and it's worked fine, but, you know, it makes mileage, right? So um, as you can see there on my arm, that was at one point worth like over $500 uh, when the Raspberry Pi spike started going up. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a flex. Um, if you're going for active taps for gigabit connection monitoring, et cetera, you can buy these, these Wireshark taps that are like $230, and they look like a tap. Um, or you can use what they might already own in their network closet and just duplicate the port or mirror the ports or mirror four ports to do whatever you want. Right? So uh, try to blend in more with the environment. Talking about wireless, I personally think you should all stop using wi uh, Wi-Fi pineapples. Um, I'm not paid by anybody to say this, but like Linux plus better cap and five gigahertz cards go a long way with just being able to troubleshoot and do your own things. I've had Wi-Fi pineapples fail me uh, quite a few times in very critical uh, sections of the operation. Ponogachi is awesome. It's a great little starter kit. You can go and flash one of the two forks that's working now. Um, your antenna can give you different ranges. You all know about this probably much more than I do because I'm not a very big RF nerd. Um, but do your research on what cards support what wireless stacks. So your hosting AP, bridging networks, and all that, you want to make sure that's all there. And take your full PCAPs during your wireless activities. Have a buddy take full PCAPs while you're doing your hacking and all that. And so you can deduplicate and say, yeah, that was me. I sent those packets. Or, oh, yeah, I stole that handshake. Whatever. And here's just an overview diagram of a Yagi antenna. This is more directional, right? And it gets you longer range. And there's a CAN antenna as well. Uh, so check those out. So talking about practicing on your own, how do you practice on your own and, uh, when you don't have access to these like red team environments and uh, places that are, you're normally given a lot of authorization to via contracts? Well, if you're authorized to be on either side of a door, that's a great place to start. Um, if you're focusing on info gathering, I think that's awesome. What you can do is you can be authorized for certain spaces and kind of dig in by asking or wandering around, right? And DEF CON's a great place for that. B-Side's a great place for that, right? Um, here's an example. So there was an auction for a gym that was nearby. And I said, oh, OK, they have an open house. Let's go to the open house, right? And I went to the open house, and you know, I was just walking around and being nice to people, just checking things out. And you know, you just like walk into places, and it's, it's an open house, so it's open, right? Like you're supposed to be there. Uh, granted, when I got to the network closet and like was walking around the keys, uh, I, as I was walking out, they're like, "Oh, you, you're not supposed to be here." And I was like, "Oh, I just wanted to buy stuff." And they were like, oh, OK. <laughs> you know, went about your day. But always try to find more information about environments you're already in, right, that you don't own, uh, hopefully. Here's a resources dump. I encourage you to check out all these resources, uh, physical security bypass games. Uh, Bosnian Bill has some great videos. Lockbeak and Lawyer, Deviant Alum, Not So Civil Engineer has a great playlist. Uh, the Humble Firefighter, she has great uh, respectful entry playlists that you can look at a lot of these tools on and more. So takeaways from this. Be resourceful. Become ungovernable. Once you've learned a concept, go back and do it with shittier tools for fun. Repeat this until you can do it with as minimal supplies as possible and do it under pressure, do it under duress. Um, stay out of trouble, though. And uh, I do help organize a conference in Wichita called OSSEC. So yeah, if you can and you're in town around that date, those dates, October 18th and 19th, uh, check us out. Well, I'll be there. And yeah, any questions? Uh, we've reached the end of the talk. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Yeah. Thanks. Um, for the polymer clay key mold, yeah. do you bake the clay? Do you do it while it's still wet? Do you use air dry clay? Awesome question. So don't use air dry clay. Um, what I do is that Sculpey 3 clay is actually the baking kind, but I don't bake it, right? Yeah, yeah, because it'll shrink. So you'll notice when you pull it out of the mold um, in terms of the texture, you'll pull this key out. Oh, went too far. You'll pull this key out, and essentially, you'll see where the metal was residing on the clay. It's already kind of solid, right, and baked. Um, so yeah, you don't want to bake it. You just want to get it hot enough. The Cero Safe I was working with melted at, I believe, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So what is that? Just under like boiling or something like that. Um, so yeah, mileage may vary. Uh, Woods Metal I think has a higher boiling point, but yeah, Cero Safe has varying very uh, boiling points. So yeah, uh, don't don't bake it. Don't use air dry. Just use normal bake bake clay. Other questions? Don't be shy. 
Um, the magnet bypass for the magnetic alarms. Yeah. Uh, does stuff like orientation of the magnet matter for most alarms, or can you just, like, shove it on there and it works? Great question. So, yeah, for this alarm that is $3 on Amazon, it does not matter the orientation I found out later on. Um, normal magnets, like quality stuff that's sold to you by a vendor, yes, it does matter. And that's why you have this detector here or you use your uh, sheet of polarity paper to detect what polarity it is because you want to essentially match the portion of the polarity that is off on the opposite side of, of this node, right? Um, or the opposite side of the node you're trying to not trip. Um, so yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yep, cool. Uh, other questions? All right, then. Uh, have you encountered any uh, door that has a piezoelectric door relay system at the other side where you have to maybe use your under door tool to wave at it or actuate the piezoelectric sensor to open a door or something? Are you talking about the, uh, the REC sensor, the request to exit sensors? Yeah. Yeah, so your request uh, exit sensors are normally, um, your cheaper ones are passive infrared and they'll they'll be very easy to trip. Um, there have been some newer ones on the market that claim to do motion detection and human detection and all that, but they don't really get into the specs of how they do that. Obviously, there's got to be a way to fool these. But yeah, you can use canned air. Um, there have been stories of people using blow-up dolls as well uh, with a, a hair dryer and hot air on, on setting. You can get a, a hair dryer for, I think, $10. I got one at Walmart. was like the cheapest one. And the blow-up doll was like $50, which is crazy. You can buy five hair dryers for the price of one blow-up doll. But, um, yeah, so you can uh, you can trigger those passive infrared ones pretty easily as long as you're displacing enough temperature um, in the in the frame. Um, so yeah, I actually recorded some video demos where uh, I was browsing forums and I, I had seen people talk about putting Tupperware over them to to just cover them if you know these are rigged to trigger something when they detect movement if you're trying to stay in in an area, uh, and that actually works pretty well as long as you're fast and you don't change the lighting too much uh, in terms of variance. But yeah, passive infrared, you know, uh, people use CO2 cans as well. Uh, Davian Alam has a video of using small compressed CO2 cans. I think the air duster for computers is better because you get a flexible pretext. Like, oh yeah, I'm the IT guy. Here's my fucking uh, duster I use to clean your computers. Versus, oh, here's this weird thing that looks like a miniature bomb, right? Like in the palm of my hand. So uh, does that answer your question? Cool. Other questions? If not, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, yeah, thank you for your time and really appreciate it.